Hello everyone, my name is Taylor. And I'm Kelly. And we are the co-hosts of Jumping Bomb Audio, the podcast all about Joshi Pro Wrestling here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Every other Monday, we are with you talking about the biggest news in Joshi, along with show reviews, previews, and much, much more. So if you're new to Joshi or you've been a longtime fan, this is the show for you. We've got something for everyone here. So check us out, Jumping Bomb Audio. Hi, my name is Tyler Fornis, and I am the co-host of The Good, The Bad, and The Hunky here on the Voice Wrestling Podcasting Network. Every week, my co-host Fred Moreland and I discuss all the happenings of all elite wrestling and everything going on in the universe of Tony Khan. We talk about Dynamite, we talk about Rampage, and we will talk about Collision when the time comes as well, along with all the appearances outside of AEW from all the best talents in all elite wrestling. This is one of the more cohesive wrestling companies in the entire world, and we discuss every intricacy about it, including the unique booking of Tony Khan that is both a huge positive and a major detriment. Check us out every single Thursday here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. It's my music. You're listening to Music of the Mat on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to Music of the Mat, the podcast devoted exclusively to the music of pro wrestling. It's all part of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. I'm your host, Andrew Rich. This is episode 166, and it's about the themes of June Kasai. And today I am joined by a first-time guest here on the show. He is a contributor at Voices of Wrestling. It's Kevin Hare. Hello, Kevin. Hi, Andrew. How's it going? Thanks for having me on. I'm good, man. How are you? I'm doing well. Very well. Um, I'm excited to finally be on, so... Yeah, yeah, it's your first time on here, like I said, and uh, I think the only other time we've podcasted together was many years ago, we did an episode of Wrestling Omakase with John Carroll, where we talked about, I think, the first 10 shows of the 2017 G1, and reviewed like 50 matches or whatever, it was was crazy. (laughs) (laughs) That, (laughs) I I forgot that you were part of that, I still think about that one, because it was very crazy, very... It was every single match, takes on every single one for the entire tournament. So it's one that is kind of burned in my brain for how, uh, (laughs) I guess, extensive it was. I'll I'll say it that way. (laughs) Definitely, definitely. Well, well, luckily, you know, our workload today is considerably lighter than it was back then. (laughs) So we're not going three hours, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. But but since it's your first time on the show here, Kevin, I'll ask you this. Uh, How did you become a wrestling fan? How did you get into it? Um, so when I was very young, uh, I had a babysitter that would get me toys and cards and stuff, and she would get me a ton of wrestling action figures and cards. Those are the two things I really remember. So this would have been probably around 1992, 1993. Um, and as you know, like with this type of stuff, it's probably always a year or two behind, right? So the stuff I was getting was probably very late 80s early 90s um like 90 91 and obviously in that era kind of a year or two is is a long time so that's probably i remember you know bushwhackers and hulk hogan and all that stuff so it was it permeated very young but i didn't know how to watch it and my parents never liked it so i didn't really start watching until a few years later like i i would have seen some stuff here or there but then um with the Attitude Era and Stone Cold Steve Austin and the NWO and the shirts and everything kind of permeating culture, you would see it everywhere. Um, it became more of a periphery thing and more of a, like, this is something that I want to find out. So then the first match I really remember watch, like, I think I saw some stuff before that, but the first one that really, um, that I rented the VHS of that, like, 
was the life changer was the Undertaker versus Mankind Hell in a Cell match. That'll do it. That'll yeah. <laughs> that'll stick with you right. for sure. Yeah. Right. And I I didn't know. I I saw the video VHS uh cassette and like the ta- the cover and I knew like it seemed interesting so it seemed cooler than the other tapes that were there. But I did not know what I was renting. Like I didn't know it was this big. Even this would have probably been like a year later or so, six months or a year later, so probably early 1999. I did not know. So I watched it completely unaware of what I was watching, which made the experience so much cooler. Um, it made I I'm sure I would have liked it anyway, but not knowing and seeing how crazy it actually was is what made me like intrigued and get obsessed. And I think that it's kind of an interesting tie into our topic. I'm sure that at least somewhat that kind of shaped what I like in wrestling and how I consume it and like what my preferences are. Um, because that is the, the first thing that I remember is this brutal, bloody match with just, you know, big high spots and brutality and blood and emotion and all that. And I think that that has really shaped my preferences and, and what I like in wrestling. You know, I like everything, but I certainly, especially these days, I trend towards the brawls and the blood and the spectacle and all that. And I, I'm sure I'm 100% in my mind that that match is what shaped those preferences. Mm-hmm. And uh, has music played a big part in your wrestling fandom over the years? Uh, yeah. I mean, well, it, as far as my life goes beyond wrestling, music is one of the biggest things that has like, uh, I'm really into, you know, the hardcore music scene and stuff. And all of that is like, it's kind of my lifestyle. It, it, it permeates like everything that I do with morals, my friends, all that stuff. So I think being so, you know, involved and obsessed with music, of course, that's going to relate to wrestling. So like a, a lot of memories and music, uh, like it all ties together with wrestling stuff. And then sometimes there's even been some like wrestling bands and that type of thing. So um, it all kind of ties together. And, and I've done some like uh, fanzines before when I was younger and some of them were like both a hardcore music and a wrestling fancy. And like some pages would be about wrestling. Some things would be about music and just kind of tying it all together. Mm-hmm. Well, there's definitely going to be some hardcore music today. Uh, that's for damn sure. And uh, it's funny, you know, last episode I did was with uh, Mike Spears about Ultimo Dragon. And that episode had a lot of, you know, East Asian music and poppy stuff and electronica and things like that. Uh, not the case here, uh, but um, then again, you know, the guy we're talking about here today is a much different kind of wrestler than Ultimo Dragon is, uh, Kevin. Yeah, I, I, a little bit. Uh, I mean, you don't think about like majestic high flying and stuff when you think of Kusai <laughs> with the goggles on and everything. Well, you know, the, the Pearl Harbor splash is a form of flying, I suppose. Yes. So it does does kind of work there, I guess. Yeah, but um, but uh, but yes. Today we're talking about the themes of the crazy monkey, Jun Kasai. Uh, not just one of the most famous Japanese deathmatch wrestlers of all time, but one of the most famous deathmatch wrestlers, period. You know, I think if you live anywhere in the world and you like deathmatch wrestling, be it Japan, America, Mexico, UK, wherever, you know who Jun Kasai is. And that's because he's a very memorable guy. You know, never mind the matches. You take one look at him and his white eye and his scarred up forehead and his scarred up chest and it's scarred up back, and it's scarred up everything, and you'll remember him for a very long time to come, Kevin. Yeah, I, th- I think so. I mean, you talk about deathmatch and deathmatch wrestlers, and obviously Onita is number one of all time, right? That's who you think of with that. But he's the whole Kogan of deathmatch stuff. So his matches are, you know, big and epic and drama-filled, but it, they're not really as brutal. It's like, I don't want to say fake brutality because that's not fair, but it, it's all about the smoke and mirrors, right? There is some blood and explosions, but it's all about the drama. But Jun Kasai, when you talk about, you know, the light tubes and the actual brutality, deathmatch wrestling, the survival aspect of it that's really played, um, especially in the Japanese deathmatch stuff uh, since the late 90s, early 2000s, Jun Kasai is what you think of with that. And yeah, you were, you were talking about his characteristics. And to be honest, you even missed the thing that I think about that that really sends him over the top is just you see his mouth and his teeth and how mangled it all is <laughs> and everything. And like that combined with it all, he's just 
he has this uh, charisma. It, obviously, he has like a physical um, or, you know, emotional charisma where you just see him and he lights up the room. But he really does have this physical charisma, too, where you just see him and right away you're drawn to him. He's intriguing. He looks unlike any other wrestler that you've ever seen. Um, that's, you know, he and every, you talk about unique looks, but like he really does. There's I can't think of anybody else maybe even more unique looking than him. So it all just comes together. Like you said, even before any of the matches, he's this guy that just absolutely pops off the, off the screen. And I think um, in some ways too, I think that because he's a deathmatch wrestler, people just lump him in with um, other, just, you know, with the genre in general, like kind of more, I don't mean mainstream because I, I, well, more like straightforward wrestling fans or whatever, um, even within Puro and, and other stuff, I think that they just kind of lump him together. But it, it's it's kind of uh, does him a bit of a disservice because I think that it 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 doesn't acknowledge just how good he is within his role and his style. I mean, there's not really many people who understand what they're trying to do and their style better than him. Uh, and it, it really, once you see a match, I think that it just kind of, you get really curious and intrigued and you have to see more of it just because he's just, like I said, he pops off the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not a huge deathmatch guy myself to be clear. You know, it's not my right. favorite right. kind of match, but I've definitely seen a few Kasai matches over the years and they're pretty engaging mainly because, you know, he's so engaging. Like I said, Kevin, he's got this big personality and this very endearing charisma to him where, you know, even when he's getting slammed onto razor boards, it's it's oddly charming in a way. And, you know, I love the uh, Despy match he had last year that made the VOW Top 10. And I love the match he had this year, the tag, against Mox and Homicide and Cork and Hall. So, yeah, even someone like me who isn't a huge deathmatch guy, I still pay my respects to Jun Kasai as, you know, deathmatch royalty, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, and you say charming. I mean, he is like an oddly charming guy as well. Um, he's he, he's his daughter is very uh, he, she's around and he uh, he like you see her at the end of uh, matches. He's bloody and picking her up and uh, like she's kind of all smiles and he's all smiles. And and you talk about those matches recently, like the Desperado June Kasai one, that was one that was kind of like every year or two there's, we try to get a death match or some weird match that kind of resonates a little bit more. And um, that's the one where it was like this, hopefully this will be placed high in the top 10. Um, you had that Moxley tag match uh, earlier this year where, I mean, the entrance is just unbelievable with like, people just screaming for Jun Kasai as loud as they can. And just, like I said, he just pops off the screen. He's this charismatic guy and it, it all makes the matches better. I'm, I actually, I've seen him a few times live. I saw, I went to Japan a few years ago and uh, he was on the big Japan show. He's not in big Japan anymore, but every once in a long while he pops up and he popped up in like an anniversary match there. And then uh, earlier this year and one of the strangest, guest appearances that I've ever seen uh, at the end of Tournament of Survival um, as uh, Rina Yamashita was celebrating in the ring, a uh, masked individual came out, eventually turned on her, and it was Jun Kasai just there randomly. He wasn't on the show. He didn't wrestle that day. He didn't wrestle the next day. He just came out, attacked her, Rina, and then that was pretty much it. And uh, of course, I was jumping up and down and pacing i think i covered about 500 uh miles during that just running around you got your you steps know? in yeah <laughs> yeah i got my steps in for sure so um just by the fact that i didn't think i was going to see him all at all and there he is just running by me i was just jumping up and down oh my god oh my god and uh it was awesome right yeah and it's actually you know pretty timely to talk about Jun Kasai now given that this month marks his 25th anniversary as a wrestler which is pretty amazing that you know a guy who has made a living just putting his body through so much pain and misery for that long is not only still going, but he can still move around like relatively well too. So like it, it's pretty crazy there, Kevin. Yeah, and he's done a really good job. Where of course he's older, and of course he he can't move around as well, and and he's a little bit more limited. 
but he's adjusted his style in a way that you don't notice. It's very natural. Like, obviously, right now, Tanahashi, everybody can notice. He hasn't been able to figure it out yet. Um, maybe he's so far gone that he won't be able to, but it hasn't. He did for a long time, and right now he doesn't. Drew Kasai hasn't quite gone there yet. Like, you watch his matches, and I probably his mo- the most famous match of his career is probably going to be that old Desperado match from last year, at least as far as with, you know, um, Western fans for, I don't like the term, but I can't think of anything else. So, like, with that type of, you know, American wrestling fan or whatever, I think that that's probably going to be the match that he's most famous for because it's, you know, it wasn't New Japan, but it was adjacent against a wrestler that people are more familiar with. And that was his 24th year in. So, and and again, you didn't, you don't, there's no like flaws to his performance in it. He looks great. He's still going hard. And I don't know exactly how old he is, but I assume he's got to be at least probably early 40s, but maybe even 45 or older, getting close to 50. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the longevity, like I said, is is pretty amazing and, and admirable. And, and of course, that longevity has translated to his level of influence. I mean, there are just so many guys out there who revere him like a god. And we mentioned John Moxley earlier. There you go. I mean, I love big, bloody, crazy Mox matches. You do too, Kevin. A lot of people do. Yeah. And Mox is pretty open about his love for Kasai. So if there is someone to thank for, you know the Texas death match with Hangman this year or the parking lot fight on Rampage a few days ago or stuff like that. Jun Kasai is the right man to thank, I think, Kevin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. And and that's, they did that tag match earlier this year. I hope someday that we might get a singles match between them. Uh, I don't know if I expect it, but the fact that they were already in the ring together this year makes me think that maybe it's some sort of possibility uh, in the future. So hopefully. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just uh, don't tell Renee about it, please. Don't. Oh, she's working. That's all a gimmick. I know. It. I know. It. I, I have just have to say it. She knows. She's probably the one encouraging me to do it. <laughs> Secret uh, sadist, Renee Paquette. There you exactly, go. Yeah. 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 So, um, so let's get to these themes here. Uh, not a lot on the docket, uh, mainly because Kasai has used one song for the majority of his career. So we'll get through this in a relative jiffy, I think, and uh, we'll start off with that classic song. That Kasai has used in many promotions over the years, from Big Japan to Freedoms and CZW, New Japan, All Japan, and so on and so forth. This is by the band Coco Bat, off the EP Tsukiyo Okami, which means Moon Wolf in Japanese. This is Devil. So if this episode was only about one song, I mean, this is the perfect song to represent Jun Kasai. I mean, the opening cymbal hits into the big whoa, and the crunchy metal riffs, and the ferocity, and the yelling vocals. It's like a sonic barbed wire board to the face. And yeah, is it my cup of tea? Not really, but for a guy like Jun Kasai and his style and look and presence and aura and all that stuff, it's it's perfect, Kevin. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree. When you uh, proposed this episode, I didn't even like think about the idea that he had other theme songs because this one is so intrinsically linked to him, his character. Um, you hear those woes and you just start chanting Kasai in your room after that. Um, the music fits perfectly. Like, you know, there's probably, I don't, I don't want to limit things, but there's probably like, what, two types of, Japanese theme songs you have those like all Japan style new Japan style like epic sounding orchestral compositions or whatever and then you kind of have these type of songs and um 
without really thinking too much about it, I feel like this has to be one of the better ones. When you when you see somebody and their music just starts playing, um, you know, and those it all just goes together. That's what you want, and that's exactly what happens with this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, what better kind of music is there for a hardcore wrestler than a hardcore punk and metal band, yep. which is not about being conventional or pop friendly or, um, as the Briscoes would say, cosmetically pleasing. You know, right, it's right. about the freedom to yell and scream and thrash and go as hard as you can and get a following that way, which is what Kasai has embodied in his career, too. He is not a conventional wrestler. He is not cosmetically pleasing, but he is himself, and that has allowed him to attract this really big following, Kevin. Yeah, and and I actually have a little bit of a, a story about that one that I, that I was told. So um, I was talking to uh, Damien Abraham one time who does the Turn Out a Punk podcast, and he um, did that show, The Rest. I think it was called The Wrestlers on uh, on Vice. Vice. I remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one of the one of the um, episodes was deathmatch stuff so he went to japan and he talked to jun kasai and stuff and um hardcore and punk in japan is really this like it's its own unique thing it's got a lot of lore um it's unique it's it's in some ways adjacent to japanese wrestling because it has its own culture tons of bands um and so damien is really nerdy into that stuff so he goes there and he sees Jun Kasai, you know, for years, and he just goes, that guy has to be into hardcore and punk. Like, I see him, there is absolutely no way that he is <laughs> not into this. So he was so excited, he's like, uh, so he met Jun Kasai, and so he asked him, like, you know, he asked if he likes music or what, what he's into or whatever, and Jun Kasai was like, yeah, I don't really like music at all. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really, it's, it's funny. You see this guy and you have all these images of it and then he's just like, eh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, I didn't know this about the song until very recently. Um, this is actually a cover of a song from the 80s by a Japanese band called Gastunk, G-A-S-T-U-N-K, who are said to be very influential in that kind of hardcore, metal-y punk scene. And much like this version here, I have absolutely no idea what they're saying. <laughs> but, you know, with that sound and with that, that title, Devil, I, I get the gist of it, I think, there, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's one that I've never, a uh, Japanese band that I haven't heard, but I at least need to go find the original just to see what the differences are and, and how, if they're similar, if they're completely different. Right, yeah. And uh, again, Devil is just perfect for Junkasai. I mean, oh, yeah, that guy... Course looks like a demon and he has that that demon mentality of i will make you suffer maybe i'll suffer too but i don't care because you'll suffer more so it's perfect kevin for sure it's funny because his his nickname is the crazy monkey which you see him now and i guess you can make it uh make sense like just fighting your head because he kind of you could see it maybe looking like a deranged outbreak style <laughs> the crazy attacking monkey but like when you see his older matches, he has a tail and is eating bananas and stuff. So it's not <laughs> like it's kind of funny how the image of him has changed, where something like Devil is way more appropriate for him than that. We need that Jun Kasai Space Monkey tag team now, damn it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I'm surprised that Black Label Pro hasn't already tried to do it. <laughs> One of these days we'll get it, I'm sure. I'm sure. But, um,. But that was the main Kasai theme there, uh, but there have been a few others he's had over the years. Uh, this one he used in Hustle, as well as Noah, I believe. It's by Go Diego, and it was the theme song to a TV show in the 70s called Sayuki, which means Magic Monkey, and it's called Monkey Magic. <laughs> Monkey 
So we've taken a pretty big left turn here, uh, going from 90s hardcore punk to 70s disco rock. With nice clean vocals and melodies and synths and funky bass lines, it's a real 180. And um, obviously we can assume they picked this because of the Crazy Monkey nickname, Monkey Magic, Crazy Monkey, there you go. And the TV show is about the classic Chinese story, Journey to the West, which is about the Monkey King. So, you know, on paper, thematically, it's a bit of a stretch, it's a bit tenuous. But honestly, if you look at the lyrics here, Born from an egg on a mountaintop, the punkiest monkey that ever popped. He knew every magic trick under the sun to tease the gods and everyone and have some fun. That sounds like Junkasai to me, Kevin. I don't know about you. Yeah, I think so. Other than the born from an egg part, I'm, that part is a little bit uh, questionable even for Junkasai or a monkey. But yeah, I think <laughs> that the rest of that completely makes sense. This this one, when when I listened to it, it completely threw me for a loop. Uh, the, the theme certainly makes sense, but otherwise it completely... We talked about how the last song fits aesthetically really well. This one absolutely does not fit aesthetically one bit <laughs> so but i mean i could see it you said that it was it used in places like noah and stuff so i guess that does make sense of why like i could see that but unfortunately it's like a prelim Mo- noah theme song <laughs> mm, yeah well i looked at some more lyrics here and uh this works pretty well too with a little bit of monkey magic there'll be fireworks tonight with a little bit of monkey magic everything will be all right uh, now, if you go on Junkasai's cage match and search for the word fire, there's a lot of results, okay? There's many I mean, <laughs> he's, he's had all sorts of fire death matches over the years, including, Kevin, a match in your Wrestling 101 project, which was Kasai and Matsunaga versus Nick Gage and Zandig. So, yeah, there have been a lot of fireworks in Junkasai matches over the years, Kevin, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely for sure. So when you were saying that, I... I completely, I spaced that he was in that match, but as soon as you said fireworks, the light bulb went off, and I was like, you know what, that that part of the song is absolutely uh, uh, appropriate, and I think uh, plugging that match a little bit in that project, absolutely go watch, if you've never seen Fire Road Match, uh, go watch it, there's at least a clip version on YouTube, but it's one of the most psychotic, insane wrestling matches you've ever seen. Now, don't don't get me wrong. I'm not going to say it's good, <laughs> but it's memorable. You've never seen anything like it. I think that uh, the one-on-one project is things that everybody should should watch. That absolutely is one that every single person should watch just for the pure insanity of it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, whatever about Noah, I mean, remember, this is Hustle, too. I mean, this yeah, is that's very true. the wackety schmackety promotion to end all wackety schmackety. That's very you know, true. Where um, Great Muda once spat miss into a woman's vagina and she gave birth to Akibono. So, you know, <laughs> Junkasai having this catchy monkey magic song is it's part of the course, Kevin, I think. I think I, I agree with you for that. Hustle is one of those blind spots for me where for years I've been meaning to do a rewatch and I've started or not a rewatch, a watch through. And I've started a little bit but I haven't ever actually done it. So maybe this will inspire me to at least find some of the June Kasai hustle stuff. Mm-hmm. So another song that Kasai has used, uh, he had this in Big Japan in Zero One as well. Uh, this is by Skid Row off the album Slave to the Grind. This is, of course, Monkey Business. quite the journey here, uh, going from a Japanese hardcore band to a funky 70s rock hit, 
And uh, now to the vocal stylings of Sebastian Bach and Skid Row. And uh, I think similar to Go Diego in that song, you look at the word monkey in the title and bingo, there you go, there's your reasoning. But, I mean, really, you know, if you have a rock or a metal song that has enough of an edge to it, I think you can make it work for someone like Jun Gasai. You know, obviously, the harder the better would be preferable, but this is a good song, I think, and it has enough oomph to work well for Kasai, I think, Kevin. Yeah, I do like the idea of just, it's very obvious with this one and the other one, that somebody just, they were just sitting around trying to think of any song about monkeys, and they came to Skid Row. Thankfully, they didn't use the actual monkeys, because I don't know if that would have been Jun Kasai either. But but yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the one thing with this style in general is that it's kind of, you know, the epic 80s metal type of stuff. It They are good wrestling theme songs. So even if it's not like the best type of that style or whatever, it still is going to work as a good wrestling theme song. So that's kind of what I came away from this being like, you know, it's not as good as his other ones as far as theme songs, but you can't really go wrong with something like Skid Row. I mean, you can just imagine watching your old grime me big pan tapes with and Jun Kasai coming out of this. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the lyrics, there are a lot of references to people who are on uh, well, Skid Row. Uh, kangaroo lady with a bourbon in her pouch. Slim intoxicado drinking dime store hooch. Little creepies playing dollies in the New York rain. A psycho on the edge of a human garbage dump. The freaks come out at 9 and it's 20 to 10. You know, it's the fringes of society. It's the outcasts. It's the ones that, you know, are not pleasant to look at. And like we said before, Jun Kasai checks off those boxes. He's an unconventional man and an unconventional, you know, fringe style of wrestling. And he usually wrestles in places that are not on the mainstream path. You know, Big Japan, Zero One, Freedoms, CZW, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, monkey reference, we got it, we got it. But lyrically, it does work a little bit deeper there too, Kevin. Yeah, uh, I, I would agree with that for sure. I mean, it's, it's perfect. He's a scummy, weird wrestler, and he hangs out in the scummy, weird places. Absolutely. So... The last song we'll touch on here is a song that Kasai used in CZW a few years ago, as well as Big Japan, again. And it's another American band here, Slipknot. This is off of their self-titled album. It's Wait and Bleed. I felt the air rise up in me, kneel down and clear the stone of leaves. I wonder out where you can see, inside my shell I wait and bleed. I felt the air rise up in me, kneel down. So for this one, I went to the lyrics here, and I did a big control F for the word monkey. And I got nothing. No monkeys, <laughs> no apes, no chimps, no simians, none of that. But there are quite a few references to bleeding. And if there's one thing that Junkasai is pretty great at doing, Kevin, it's bleeding. And he's the scars to prove it. He's, he's very good at that, yes. He's, he's got the scars, and you can't even really figure out where they came from. They just came from something at some point. But I think, feel like in history, probably no theme song has been used as many times by wrestlers you've never seen than this one. <laughs> like every single backyard wrestling show, every single small deathmatch indie, somebody's coming out to wait and be by Slipknot. It would be the least surprising news ever. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, the lead singer, Corey Taylor, has said that this song is about, like, you know, flipping a switch inside your head and going from civilized person to crazed animal. Which is certainly fitting, too, given, you know, the context of being a pro wrestler. A pro wrestler has their gimmick side and their personal side. And with Kasai, when he's in deathmatch wrestler mode, he comes across like an absolute madman. And then, outside the ring, like you said earlier there, Kevin, he's just, you know, a normal dude with a family and a young daughter and all that. So, yeah, 
again, lyrically, the words go a little bit deeper than just man bleeds a lot, you know? Yeah, I mean, and he is the literal crazed animal anyway with the crazy monkey. So that all makes sense for sure. Um, my thinking is CZW just found, uh, they were like, we need a song for June Kasai. And then somebody likes Slipknot and they uh, just slapped it on there. I don't think that Zandig is going too deep to figure out why he's putting a, what June Kasai's entrance music is going to be. He's just, oh, Slipknot, is, that's the band right now. So they just slapped it on there. But it makes sense. It's it's kind of perfect for the era, the aesthetic, the company, Junkasai. So it all makes sense. You could just see old to early two thousands music videos on whatever would have been before YouTube on Kazaa or whatever, <laughs> downloading them and and just seeing grainy footage of Junkasai just jumping off of cages and doing dives and light tubes and all that stuff. Well, I think Slipknot and Junkasai just work well together in general. You know, to uh, not just very intense groups, but uh, very colorful ones as well. They have that flair for showmanship in both. And it's not about just playing a song or just having a match. It's about putting on a spectacle and the yeah. biggest one you can. So they do share that kind of goal and mindset, I think, Kevin. Yeah, I yeah, I, I agree with you for that. I mean, when I was younger, Slipknot was one. I liked this song. I liked like maybe some other stuff on the radio, but I never bought a CD, so it never really resonated. I know some other people that still count Slipknot's as some of their favorite bands. Somebody told me just yesterday that uh, Slipknot was their favorite band, but for me, it, it always passed me by just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do like some Slipknot, like their their bigger hits, like Before I Forget and Duality and Psychosocial. Like Those songs are much more my speed and my, my jam, uh, as they say. So, yeah. But um, All right, well, that's going to do it for this episode of Music of the Mad. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, Kevin... Thank you so much for being here. Your first time on. It was so much fun. And uh, as well, it was a lot less bloody than an actual Junkasai <laughs> match, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm glad to come on and spread the gospel of Junkasai just a little bit. I, like I said, I think he's one of the more underappreciated res wrestlers in the greater wrestling lexicon, even though within his um, style, he's a legend. So I think anything that kind of just brings a little bit of attention to him, I think that that's all good. Mm -hmm. uh, any plugs you want to give? Go right ahead. Yeah, so the, the biggest thing we mentioned a little bit already is the Wrestling 101 project. Um, it's on, on voiceofwrestling.com. It's also thewrestling101.com. Um, every few weeks, Robin Reed and I uh, curate. So I, I've written a decent amount of it, but it's not um, limited to uh, that. We just curate this a bunch of articles that are um, 101 matches that every wrestling fan should watch. Um, they're not necessarily the best matches ever, although many of them can consider uh, can be considered that. They're just matches that we think that everybody should see. It was spurned by somebody not seeing Bret Hart versus Owen Hart at uh, WrestleMania 10, and we figured, to me, that was a match that everybody should see So, um, and have an opinion on it. So that's kind of the basis for this project we've posted i think 51 matches so far um so we're about halfway through um like i said those articles get posted every few weeks but there's no real strict schedules to it so whenever they get done um you've done a few for us as well mm -hmm. i know the most recent one was nakamura and Ibushi, right that was yours so yep. and you did um the uh, Kobashi and Kikuchi Can-Ams match, which yep. is you talk about sounds and stuff with that match, and you're the perfect guy for that one. That match is all about the sounds and the, the atmosphere and all that. Yeah, it's a great project, and everyone who contributes to it does such a great job. And, uh, I mean, you got Dave Meltzer to write a blurb for you. That's, yeah. that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I truly could not believe when I emailed Dave, I emailed him like every one of these, and he never responded, so I thought maybe he wasn't reading it. And then I just said, Dave, could you write a little bit about this? And within an hour or two, he had something for me. And I just could not. It was unbelievable. It was awesome. I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot shorter than a usual Dave writing piece. You know, it's not, yeah. a, <laughs> it's not an observer obituary. We'll, we'll put it that yeah. way. So, you know. <laughs> I wasn't sure what I was going to get, but I can't complain about anything. So I was perfectly fine that he, only, he gave me a paragraph and it was perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I said, it's such a really cool project all around. It's it's really neat. Yeah, I'm really happy with it. I feel like it's kind of my very small wrestling legacy, which is cool. 
Definitely, yeah, yeah. And um, Music of the Met is, of course, part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. You can find all the great shows on there at VoicesOfWrestling.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Music of the Mat. Follow me on Twitter at Andrew T. Rich. VoicesOfWrestling.com slash Discord for all discussions and comments. VoicesOfWrestling.com slash Donate for any donations. Uh, just click the big Donate button beneath the name of Music of the Mat. If you donate, hey, thanks so much. You're awesome. And of course, rate, review, subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and many other places. Kevin, thank you again. I'll see you around. Thanks, Andrew. All right. For Kevin Hare, I'm Andrew Rich, and I'll see you next time on Music of the Mat. Take care, guys. Music of the Mat is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The songs used throughout this show are property of their respective copyright holders. Hi, my name is Tyler Fornis, and I am the co-host of The Good, The Bad, and The Hunky here on the Voice Wrestling Podcasting Network. Every week, my co-host Fred Moreland and I discuss all the happenings of all elite wrestling and everything going on in the universe of Tony Khan. We talk about Dynamite, we talk about Rampage, and we will talk about Collision when the time comes as well, along with all the appearances outside of AEW from all the best talents in all elite wrestling. This is one of the more cohesive wrestling companies in the entire world, and we discuss every intricacy about it, including the unique booking of Tony Khan that is both a huge positive and a major detriment. Check us out every single Thursday here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Hello there, my name's Neil David and I'm the host of Eurograps Express, the podcast exclusively dedicated to the wrestling of Europe. If it's wrestling and it happens in Europe and it's good, we talk about it. Whether it's RevPro, Progress, WXW, Passion Pro, Pro Wrestling Chaos, Pro Wrestling North, we don't care, we talk about them all. If it's good and it's exciting, I want to share it with you. We're on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Check us out on the feed. Check us out on Twitter at Eurograps EXP. And join us for chat about European wrestling and a little bit of chat about cheese. Hopefully see you there.